Hey team, Clara here from the Sewing Junction, except this is the at home edition. Uh, I've been thinking about you guys a lot and just wanted to check in. If you are not in one of our classes that are currently underway, you might not have heard yet, but as with many other businesses, we have made the decision to temporarily close our doors to promote social distancing and to help encourage the continued health of our community. Um, yeah, we made that decision last Sunday. So uh, while it can be scary for a lot of small businesses and people who are self-employed all over, um, it was actually a really easy decision because it's simply the right thing to do. We need to stay home. We need to stay safe. We need to keep other people safe. Um, so I know in my heart that uh, I'll be sewing with all of you again soon once it's safe to do so. Um, now another thing you may not know is that today is the Sewing Junction's six year anniversary. Yay. Um, today. So it's been an astonishingly beautiful experience for me to be able to sew with you all and see the joy and the creativity and the accomplishments that have come out of it. Um, so as a six year anniversary gift to you, I wanted to offer you a free class in this video. Um, something I hope will lift your spirits. Something I hope will remind us of our industry, of our creative minds and uh, the astounding beauty that can be found right in our homes, even amidst isolation. So today we are making bunting. It's just, there's something magical about bunting. Um, it has like sunshine and unicorns and cheer just built in. Um, the colors and the simplicity and the endless possibilities of what you can do. Um, for example, variations in the shape of what you've attached. Come on, come on. And then this is another one of my favorites where you use strips of fabric, just simple strips of fabric. You know what I mean? It's so cute. I love it. Okay, so this is so, so simple to make. Um, in fact, you don't need any sewing experience to be able to do this and you need very rudimentary tools. Uh, and I'm also gonna show you essentially three approaches to do this. You can have uh, the simplest sewing stitch, arguably one of the simplest in all of sewing by hand. Um, then I'll do one that's slightly more technical and a little sturdier, a bit of a cleaner aesthetic also by hand. Um, and then for those of you who happen to have sewing machines at home, I'm gonna show you the proper presser feet and um, attachment process for using a machine to sew your bunting. But I mean, here's a rundown of what you actually need. Number one, we need a hand sewing needle and we need a spool of thread. Um, I mean, in theory, you could use a stapler, but maybe don't tell me so I can still sleep tonight. No, safe space, no judgment. And I mean, come on, isolation. We do what we need to do. Um, so yeah, needle and thread, stapler, whatever it is that you're gonna use, but that's number one. Um, then we need some kind of string. So the string I love to use is called jute, okay? Um, Cause it's just a cute aesthetic. It's got that very natural handmade look, um, kind of rough in its finish. Uh, but you can really truly use anything that you have around the house. The whole idea with this is that you are not leaving the house to go get any supplies. You are thinking outside of the box and you're looking around your house to see what you already have. Um, so again, like if you don't have a needle and thread, we're stapling 
the fabric to the string. Um, if you have a needle and thread, I show you, I'll show you how to hand sew. Um, and then in terms of string, I mean, it could be a drawstring from an old hoodie or an old pair of drawstring pants. Uh, you could take an old bed sheet and tear it into narrow little strips of fabric and that becomes your, your string. Um, anything you have is gonna work because it's that simple. Um, okay, and then finally we need thread. Nope, that's a lie. You need fabric. We already said thread. <laughs> We've got this. We need fabric. So you may have scraps of fabric if you're a sewer. This is a really great way to use all of your old remnant materials. Um, it's kind of sentimental actually in the end because when you use all of your old scraps, it reminds you of all of the things that you made like this was a Vogue pattern, a blouse I made a long time ago. This was remnants from a wedding dress. Um, this was the lining to a skirt. This was said skirt. Um, so many fun things. So it's a nice way to use up scraps. But again, if you're not a sewer and you don't have a fabric stash, not to worry. Use an old apron where you've got stains all over, but there's a couple of good patches. That's a nice crisp cotton. Um, you could use an old dress shirt. You could use, again, an old bed sheet. Uh, cotton is kind of my favorite material, particularly for the flags, because they hang a little bit more stiffly. So do you see that kind of angling there? That's the goal when you hang your bunting, it's sort of on an angle. So you want something that is stiff enough to hold that shape and not sort of fall on itself. Um, but that's kind of the only requirement. And then again, with this guy, that wasn't really required. This one, I'm using like a really delicate lace here and it's A-OK. -okay. So ultimately, you can't mess this up. It's so forgiving and there are no rules, which is my favorite. Okay, here we go. Um, that's it. Needle and thread, string, fabric, we've got this around the house. Now, in terms of a pattern, I just made this up when uh, we did this for our window display. So if you've hung at the sewing junction or even walked by it or driven past, you've seen our bunting all over the window because it's just so cheerful and inviting and it makes me happy. Um, okay, so we just drew shapes to make them sort of suit our needs, but I'm gonna measure this up for you with my my unicorn <laughs> measuring tape. Yes, we have these at the shop if you need that, you know, later when we're back. So, more joy. Unicorn measuring tape for the win. We've got, I believe, seven inches across the top. Shebang. And then we've got uh, eight inches lengthwise this way. Obviously, that's not perfectly straight, but I already measured. Now, I'm a little bit, you know, this is like my profession. So I <laughs> drafted seam allowance so that as this turns under, it tapers to match the flag shape. So this is something we do in hems as well. Like if you have a tapered pencil skirt, let's say, the hemline would actually be flared so that as it flips up, it matches. Um, similar principle there. But this is really not required. You could always just make it a triangle and once it's sewn down, you can trim. But that's why it's tapered in like that. Now in terms of seam allowance, I did about five eighths here, um, standard seam allowance. And then what you find is you lose about an eighth of an inch as the fabric turns over to wrap your string. So it ends up being about a half inch deep, which is perfect. Okay, so that's that. Um, the other one, let's measure her. What do we got? We got six inches across and I'm not including the seam allowance, I'm giving you that afterwards. Six and a half length, and then again, five eighths seam allowance, okay? Um, the flags are the strips of fabric, ever so pretty. These are two inches wide, two inches wide, and let's see how long. 22 and a half inches. So this is an estimation, but it just, it was cute. I kind of like the length one side folded them over and also the little knot takes up a little bit of the length there so that's the length i liked for those guys but again no rules here you can make up whatever shape you want this is very 
individualized. Okay, so if you wanna make the strips of fabric, don't worry about all the cutting because that would take quite a while. Um, you can tear fabric as long as it's a woven fabric. It's made on a loom. There are threads running in two directions. Uh, you can tear along that direction. So it's quite simple. If you just take a piece of material and you snip through one of your edges, just like that, then if you pull apart, it tears. Et voila, your little strip of fabric, just like that. And then what's so cool is when you do the next one two inches over and the next one two inches over, they're perfect. They're all exactly the same because those threads run parallel. Do not try and tear it if you're working with a knitted fabric, like my sweater is a knitted fabric. T-shirts, sweatshirts, workout clothes, uh, swimwear for women, a lot of that is gonna be knitwear, so it doesn't tear. That's a whole other conversation, okay? There we go. So, um, one thing you might have caught when I was holding this up is my bunting is double-sided, but that's simply because it went in the shop and it's in the window, so it has to look cute on both sides, naturally, because it wants to be cute inside and outside. So I double-sided everything um, so that it would kind of look reversible, but not required. If it's hanging up against your wall, there's no reason that you need to double it. It should be stiff enough. Maybe if your fabric was like really lightweight and you're trying to thicken it, you could double it up, which means you're just cutting two and you're putting the bad sides, the wrong sides facing each other before you uh, secure it to your string. So simple, but not required to double up anything. That's why I doubled mine was so it looked good on both sides. Okay, so there we go. Um, let's learn a little bit about sewing in case we don't know about that yet. Let's do some basic hand stitches. Um, hand sewing 101. Needle, nothing too, too large, something that easily passes through your fabric but doesn't um, make holes and is an appropriate size so that the thread fits through the eye of the needle. Um, little hand sewing tip a lot of people end up with way too much thread and they get lots of tangles and it ends up being an unpleasant experience so the way you want to measure your thread is the length of your arm and then across the chest and if you leave it at that amount of length you're going to find that you always have the amount that is the length of your arm at least to begin with which means you can pull your thread comfortably logic for the win um, the reason why we go across the chest is because I want a little tail and I want to tie a knot in the bottom to secure my thread. So that's why I did that. And I've got my adorable crane snips, of course. It's all in the tools. We have those at the shop too. Okay, here we go. Our thread. My favorite way to tie a knot at the end, super fast and easy, just take your thread, wrap around a couple of fingers and cross it over. So it's like touching under my thumb along my index finger. And then as I roll forward, I wanna see the threads twisting up around each other. Do you see that, how they're wrapping around each other? Um, like that. The more you wrap it, the bigger a knot you get, and the less you wrap it, the smaller. And then you just pull tight, and you have like a little knot there. That's easy, wrap and roll. So again, just around your fingers, roll forward so that they twist. Part of this is that the tail of the thread here is quite short. That is required, okay? So it'll actually wrap around. And then you grab one end, grab the other, pull tight, magical. All right. So we need to thread the eye of the needle on the other end. We're not going to lick the end of it. We're trying to keep things sanitary, team. Don't touch your face, don't lick your thread. Clean snip on the end is better than dampening the end of it. Also, that can rest your needle over time. Okay, we're gonna thread the eye of the needle. Your hand sewing needle is different than your machine needle in the sense that the sharp end and the eye are opposite on a hand sewing needle, whereas on a machine needle, they're one and the same. Okay, so there's a little tail, the knot at the base, that's it. You could do this double thickness, in other words, 
pull one end to match the other and knot them together. But what I find with that is it's a little bit harder for a beginner because as you're pulling, if you pull one side more than the other, you get these bubbles. So if you keep single thickness and are careful to not continually unthread your needle, um, it's just easier. You don't have to have as much experience. So there we go. Okay. So when I was setting this all up, I realized that I needed a dark fabric for you to be able to see on. And all I had at home was a lake warmer. <laughs> How exciting. So we're doing our hand stitching on my lake warmer. I hope you can see it enough. All right. The first stitch I wanna show you is, again, one of the simplest stitches out there. It's called a running stitch. Um, a running stitch is a very loose stitch. Uh, and we simply work from one side to the other. Now, any of you who know me already know I'm a lefty. So I am doing all my sewing left-handed, meaning I'm starting on the left side of the work and I'm working to the right with my needle in that hand. Of course, if you are right-handed, I need you to hold your needle in your right hand, starting on the right side and working left with me. All right, so I'm gonna take my needle and I'm gonna go through the layers of fabric here. And then I'm simply going to weave in and out of the fabric. Ideally, if this is equidistant, it looks nicer, okay? But I'm sewing a leg warmer, so I think we're gonna be okay. Um, pass the needle through and just gently pull it till you run into your knot. And there's a little bit of stitching there and we continue. Now what's cool about this, I'll just set it up trying to balance the fact that I want it to look nice, but I also want you to see. All right. What's cool about the running stitch is you utilize your needle, utilize the needle to actually help you sew a straight line. So if you just push your needle through, pull it off the back and go the other way, you're constantly just guessing at one point. Whereas if you weave your needle in and out, in and out, in and out, then it creates a straight ruler to then align with the stitches you've already done and where you're headed. So weave your needle, do multiple stitches at one time, and not only is it faster, but it's gonna look better, okay? See? Running stitch, so easy. Okay, oh, tying a knot on the end. That's gonna be fun, because I can't put it down. Ready? Tying a knot, we're just gonna wrap around our hand here. We're gonna uh -huh, cross this through. This is one thing I forgot to practice. And widen your fingers, and that'll place your thread really close to your fabric. Uh huh. And then put down a finger or a thumb, let everything go, and you can just pull tight like that. Little knot right at the end of your work. Okay, so again, wrap around some fingers, pass your needle through that little window, right? So that's essentially the knot to be up there. And then widen those fingers to pull that to your fabric and put down a finger or a thumb or whatever you got to pull tight. Knots. Oh, almost knotted my hair. We're good. Oh, we've got this. Okay, so that is running stitch. I'm just gonna highlight a few things for you. Um, the running stitch is a very slack stitch, so naturally it's easy for it to start to collect and gather. So if you like pull on one part of it, it can bunch things up because it's kind of like a basting stitch, a hand based. Um, so the thing with that is it's not the sturdiest. It's the easiest, but it's not the most robust. So if you're brand new to sewing, try it. It's just a running stitch, essentially basting your pieces over the, the string. I don't know why I'm trying to remove the thread for the second demo. There we go. Um, but if you're a little more confident with sewing and you want to try something a little bit harder, I'm going to show you what's called a hand sewn back stitch. This is aesthetically a little bit cuter. It's certainly sturdier. It's a very sturdy stitch because it's constantly cycling back on itself. Um, but it's a little more technical. So this is level two. If you've joined us for one of our classes like Learn to Sew, You've got this. You're already ready for the hand sewn back stitch. All right, making a knot in the end of my thread, the old wrap and roll, 
grab the tail both sides trim the extra thread okay so things to know uh, about a hand sewn back stitch um, it only looks nice from one side so this again is appropriate if you're hanging it up against the wall but not my favorite choice if something's going to be reversible um, from the front it looks like machine stitching which i kind of love about that so you can be at home with just a needle and thread and it'll look like you have a sewing machine um, so what you're going to do is you're going to start at the back so you pop your needle from the back to the front so nobody sees the knot details and you want to go backwards and then pass where you were and then go back and pass where you were and ideally keep this equidistant so from where i've come out i'm going to pull back let's say a quarter inch and then I'm gonna surpass that point by a quarter inch. So a half inch total is the length of the stitch at the back, right? And once again, I'm gonna utilize my needle to try and keep all of this straight. So can you see that? That's where I'm going in, that's where I'm coming out, and this more or less is down the middle of those two points. And I'll pull that tight. And that gives me a little stitch, okay? Now I'm gonna jump back and where I go in this time is gonna be right at the end of that previous stitch, right? Hard to see, there it is. And now once again, surpassing where I came out by about the same amount. So again, using my needle to keep these things straight. So fun on spongy knitwear lay so flat we've got this so there's another little stitch Oop. and then i go back again cross the space and another little stitch okay my knitwear is stretching out of the position there we go do you see how it's happening we're creating stitch 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 there's always a gap here because you go back and then pass it and then as soon as you're finished whenever that may be get to the end of your fabric I suspect then we send our needle to the back and we tie a knot okay so if I've done as many stitches as I was hoping for I'm going to send my needle to the back and at this point this is one of the few times you could flip your work not bad for knitwear Okay, you can flip your work. So see, it's a hot mess at the back, but that's a-okay. Um, and then tie a knot just the way we did before. Okay, so this is really the only sewing that is required for your bunting. You're gonna spend most of your time cutting your pieces out, your prep work. Oh, and while I'm thinking about it, um, anyone in the know with sewing knows that when you have what's called a raw edge, so that's simply where you've cut your material, um, any woven fabric is prone to unraveling along the raw edge. So we typically finish the raw edge with something, a zigzag stitch, a serger, a hemline, something. Um, but in this case, I really found it wasn't necessary. These little cuties have been through it. I take them down every year for our holiday decorations and pop them into storage and then take them out the next year. And while there's some wear and tear that you can see along the edges, I feel like it's just cute. I feel like it just makes them look that much more handmade. Um, particularly the torn strips, the roughness along the edges is just charming. I don't mind it at all. So don't even sweat finishing the edges. Uh, again, could not be easier. I mean, come on, it's so cute. Okay, so we've got that. Um, all right, let's talk about actually doing this. This is not hard. And then the machine option I'm going to give you right at the end. Um, so if I grab a random little scrap here, it's not even a particular shape necessarily. Okay, just a little rectangular piece. I need my string. Now, tip. In the beginning, I thought I was being so organized. I measured out my jute and gave a little bit extra for the ends. Um, and then I cut it to size and I regretted it instantly because as I was securing the fabric on, I started to have different opinions on how I wanted it to look, where I wanted it to hang, how much of an arc I wanted or how little. Um, so my advice to you is do not cut the string until it's literally on 
the wall. Um, so the first thing you want to do is have an end and we're just going to do a simple slip knot. So you're just going to put it like that, wrap around your fingers and pass that through like so. Slip knot. And once it's nice and tight, you can trim that little end. So I'm going to do that again for you. Since we're on a video, it's hard to see. Just fold it in half like that, little loop on the end, and just wrap around your fingers, passing the little looped part through. And there you are, a little slip knot. And that'll be plenty strong once you pull it really tight. And then just trim this off so that it's exactly the length that you want. So now I start attaching my flags. And what's cool about this is it's adjustable. So you want to put it on snug because we don't want them slipping about. Again, these are going to want to sit on an angle once they're on the wall. So we don't want them just slipping to the center. Um, so snug enough that it won't droop, or, droop about, but malleable. And that was really fun because I didn't have to actually plan. You can literally just start attaching fabric and then when you run out, tie another slip knot, she's done or um, put them up on the wall and then play with spacing and realize, oh, you know what, I want them closer, so I'm gonna add another flag or whatever. Okay, so don't cut the other end of the string, just the one end where you begin and keep the whole roll connected on the other side, assuming you have extra. Okay, so then it's really simple. You just lay the string at the back of your fabric, your seam allowance, if you followed the original suggestion was five eighths of an inch. So you just wrap it and you'll be left with about a half inch left over. Now I'm gonna want you to pin this in place, obviously, as we always do. Um, but this is one of the rare times where I'm gonna encourage you to pin vertically. Um, any of you who sew with me all the time know it's always perpendicular to your stitching line facing your dominant hand, no less, with your work to your left, right? I say that 20 times a day. Work to your left, pins facing your dominant hand. Now the logic there is for the sewing machine. When you're on a sewing machine, you don't have much space to the right of the needle, so you need all of the bulk of your fabric to the left. So I've set that up for myself. If I were sewing, this is my left hand, all good. Um, but we can't go perpendicular on this one, and I'll show you why. I mean, you could if you're hand sewing, but even then, not ideal, because the thread is tall. Do you see that? This is taller than down here. So if you're gonna sew this later, as soon as your presser foot puts pressure here, it's gonna torque and bend your pin. Um, I don't want that. So instead of that, we're pinning vertically, but it is super important. I hope you can see the end of the pin here. I think my colors are light, so I'm gonna switch them. The end of the pin has to be closest to you if you're gonna be doing this on a machine. I want you to pin vertically, but have the head of the pin at the bottom. And the logic is as your presser foot starts to sew, you'll still be able to pull the pin out towards you. If you have it the other way around, you're out of luck. <laughs> it's gonna be this way, and your presser foot will be sitting right in front of it, and you just won't have access to it. You won't be able to get your pins out. Um, and we do not sew over pins, obviously. <laughs> Let's be safe, folks. We have enough problems. All right, pins facing you downward vertically. And then you simply utilize whatever stitch was comfy for you. If it's the running stitch, you're gonna run that stitch there. If it's the hand-sewn back stitch, you're gonna be looking at the good side in this case um, so that the knot is at the back, but you can make sure those stitches look really pretty from the good side, because remember the back, not super cute. Okay, the only reason I'm having you do your running stitch from the back is as a beginner, it'll be easier to see the boundary of your fabric to be sure you're not slipping and missing this raw edge. Down here, I want you to be really confident that you're snuggled up beside your thread and that you're securely catching your seam allowance on the back. So running stitch for newbies, we're gonna do from the back. If we're doing a hand-sewn back stitch, we're gonna sew from the front as it is not a reversible stitch. Okay. Now, if you happen to have a sewing machine at home, lucky you, then let's talk about that a little bit. I have one of my old babies here. 
an oldie but a goodie. Um, okay, so here's the deal. The regular presser foot takes up too much space. It has an equal amount of pressure on the left and right side of the needle, and it keeps you too far from your thread. So if I tried to sew it, I'd probably not even catch the edge of my seam allowance um, because the presser foot is so wide. So what I suggest instead is what's called an adjustable zipper foot. It looks like that. Um, all of my team, you've used this before. If you did our learn to sew class, we use this to close up underneath the zipper when we do that invisible zipper installation. Um, my sewing adventure students, we've done this for the piping demo to attach your piping. Basically, it's beautiful to get close to something that's tall and bulky so that your stitch can be right beside it. The pressure from the foot is right beside the needle. And what you can see when you look at it is there's a place for the needle to sit to the right, to the left, or in the center. You have three options for needle position. Um, so you can put the pressure of the presser foot wherever you want it and get your stitching nice and close. So we love, love this little guy. Um, these are particular to the model, never mind just the brand of your sewing machine. So you always want to make sure you have the correct one for your sewing machine. Um, we carry the Janome one because that's what we use at the shop, but always make sure you have the right one. Now, you need to change the hardware, so that means you want to be super safe. You want to unplug your sewing machine, so have it off first and then unplug the cord so that there's no electricity running through as we're taking things apart. Gonna grab your screwdriver and we're gonna loosen it counterclockwise. Lefty loosey, righty tighty. And it's just to loosen with the screwdriver first and then this whole thing comes off and there's the screw. That we need to use for the next step. Now this little one has two arms, see that, wrapping there, and the screw is simply going to sit between those two little arms. So it sits on the machine like that, and the screw will attach up there. Okay, so this is always the fun part, getting the screw to reconnect, particularly with your non-dominant hand. It's a terrible idea, why am I doing that? Okay, so again, I just tighten it up by hand first and then I always use the screwdriver to snug up the rest of the way. Okay, so then you wanna do a safety check always. Anytime you're changing your hardware, you wanna be sure that your needle safely clears the hardware and that you're on the appropriate stitch style for this presser foot. So, for example, if I were on a zigzag stitch, my needle would be jumping left and right and I could pop onto the metal and break my needle. So I wanna be sure that I'm on a straight stitch, that I'm using the appropriate presser foot um, for my machine. And then I wanna check that my needle safely clears the hardware. And it's as simple as grabbing your hand wheel on the side of your machine and just walking the needle up and down a little bit to see, yeah, it safely clears this space. Now these should be very, very close. Your needle and your presser foot are not maintaining social distancing. They're all snuggled up super close together to make sure that the press, the pressure from the foot is right beside where the needle drops so that your fabric isn't slipping around. Okay, so I want to see that those are nice and close um, but not nicking in any way and the screws are really tight. Know that the um, place to adjust all of this is actually at the back of the machine or the back of the foot. So this green little screw here can be loosened and that's what slides the presser foot left and right um, so that you can change your position for your needle. Okay, makes sense. Make sure both screws are super tight. The one at the back, the one at the side. You've used your screwdriver, you've checked for safe clearance. Now we're okay to plug in our machine, turn on our light and be sewing. So again, we've prepped our fabric with pins I'm swapping out for a darker pin so you can see. And we're pinning vertically with the head of the pin closest to our body as the person sitting in front of the machine, which of course I cannot. Um, so I'm going to place the fabric onto my workstation so that the work is to the left when you're facing it. And then I'm simply going to lower my presser foot. And I just want to see that as the presser foot goes down, it's snuggled up beside that. And can you see, it's just doing such a lovely job 
of just getting right up beside the string, um, putting the needle down right beside that so that I can really decide how close or how far I want to sew to my string so that it's adjustable, but it's not shifting. Okay, and that's it. Regular sewing rules apply. My friends, we're gonna make bunting and it's gonna be beautiful and it's gonna brighten our homes and bring a little bit of cheer and sense of accomplishment and industry. Um, I miss you guys. I've already been missing class and missing sewing with you guys at the shop. But remember, there's always hope. There's always, always, always hope. And there is always beauty in the smallest, tiniest little things. It's never a bad thing to take a moment and be still. And I love that about sewing. It's a quiet, slow art form. Um, and that can be hard. It can be hard to be patient. It can be hard to sit still, particularly if you feel like it's not your choice. But it's a wonderful life lesson and it brings quite a bit of nourishment and beauty into your life. So keep your heart open, breathe deeply, check in with yourself, check that you're breathing slowly, um, check that you're still feeling, and stay inspired. Contact the people you love via phone, FaceTime. We're lucky to have the technology that we can stay in touch even though we can't be physically in the same space. Um, so we're a strong community and it's important to remember that. Be well, my friends, stay home, stay creative, and I cannot wait to be sewing with you all again soon. Bye.